um, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me here, extending the group, and uh, which made it possible for me also uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, as you can see on the slide, my name is uh, Andreas Niehaus. Um, I teach at Ghent University, but as you can hear from my accent, I'm German by birth. And um, I'm in Japanese studies. My research is, in a way, his, from a perspective of an historian, but also sociological approaches. But actually, by training, I'm a uh, philologist. So um, recently, I've also been working on um, concepts of the body in pre-modern Japan, uh, more specific, uh, Kaibara Ekiken and his Yojokun, looking at how uh, ideas of the body, of health, and so on are constructed uh, in his work. But um, my passion always was martial arts, and um, my PhD also was on a biography, and that was the biography of Kano Jiguro, so the uh, founder of judo. And um, I wanted to start actually some, writing something about the myth of these founder figures within martial arts, and I just got stuck with uh, Kano Jigoro and I continued with him. So, and this is kind of uh, something I just discovered lately, namely that there is also something like manga, where um, a life is told, and a life story is told to interested people. And I wanted to look uh, at two different biographical manga, which uh, are a manga on Kano Jigoro, the sort of founder of judo, as well as Ueshiba, Morite, uh, Ueshiba Morihei, the founder of Aikido. So um, these are the two stories I would like to talk about today. And um, I'm glad that it's a workshop because I, I fear it's not really thought through well. So I'm open for all suggestions and ideas that I uh, can get here uh, today. So uh, January, uh, 1891 on a steamer in the Indian Ocean. What you see here is a young Japanese man uh, showing, demonstrating the martial art of Judo to his fellow European travelers. But then, this is all very friendly, but then suddenly this huge Russian soldier, officer, appears challenging this young uh, Japanese uh, traveler. And although his fellow companions and travelers fear for the worst, for the small Japanese, he finally succeeds in throwing his Russian opponent on the ground and even protects the, his opponent's head when he is uh, hitting the ground. So he's hitting the ground only with his back, but not with his head, which would uh, have, as a result, serious injury. And that's very important later in the self-image of the Kodokan and the teaching of Kano, that here, even this situation, he's protecting his opponent. And as you can uh, here see as well, the audience is very impressed. And also the Russian officer, obviously, is very impressed. And what is he doing? He then uh, is, um, oops, he then is asking actually in a very um, bold way, what is your name? And Kano Jigoro answers almost James Bond-like style, my name is Kano Jigoro. So, and then uh, accompanied by the applause of the bystanders, um, then both shake hands in friendship. What happens then is the boat comes to Yokohama and by then, the news about uh, his fight has already spread in Japan. Actually, also when we look at newspapers from the Meiji period, we see that it's, it's mentioned that there was a fight on a boat and, and Kano Jigoro won that, but that's not um, part of the, the, the talk today. Uh, so it has spread and his disciples are already awaiting. And the last picture here shows Kano dressed in Western clothes. It's very interesting that his companions, his disciples, are not. Uh, so he is leaving the boat ready and determined uh, to spread Kojo, Kodokan Judo. So this episode, uh, this, this episode um, marks the uh, beginning of the manga Judo 
Norexi Kano Jigoro no Shogai, so the history of judo, the life of Kano Jigoro, which was published in 1987 and has a total of six uh, volumes. And I think that this manga can serve as a case study to the way an institution actually uh, sees itself and how an institution like the Kudokan legitimizes uh, itself by the authority of the founder. In this case, obviously, Kano Jigoro, over whose life then the institution establishes an exclusive claim of how to interpret this life. In this manga, which is thus a biographical manga, as well as the history of the uh, Kodokan institution, Kano is introduced as an enlightened and charismatic leader. Obviously, if you have a founder, he has to be charismatic and uh, enlightened. Otherwise, yeah, it's no point of writing about him. So with a strong mission, actually, to better the world. And this element of introducing the founder as enlightened visionary links the Kano manga also to the next manga that I want to uh, discuss also. It's the biographical manga Ueshiba Morihei Monogatari, which was published uh, in 2000, and for which the grandson of uh, Morihei, Ueshiba Moriteru, actually was responsible as chief editor. Here, as well as in the Kano manga, the uh, founder is introduced at the beginning of the text in an episode that in terms of chronology happens much later in the story of the life, but is seen as a turning point, as a turning point by the institution in the life of the founder. In the case of Ueshiba, we have a enlightenment. So Ueshiba is enlightened. I, I didn't show what was happening before. Actually, he was also having a fight. He was fighting and suddenly, after the fight, he won, obviously, otherwise not a story. Uh, he won and then he goes out into the nature and suddenly, oh, he is enlightened, and uh, when you s read the uh, biography, then you can also, s that the bird has a meaning because he understands suddenly what the birds are saying. So he's entirely connected to nature and to the universe. And um, I, I think that, that if we look at both biographies, we can actually also interpret these from the perspective of hagiographies. So they're very uh, much similarities uh, between both. And Ueshiba's enlightenment here is indeed a mystic one. There's no doubt about it. But what's about Kano Jigoro's enlightenment? Well, that's a totally different thing. I think here we can see enlightenment certainly um, in, in terms of a, a social uh, development. Um, but also, if we look at the iconography, iconography here in the text and take a look at the uh, rays of light that, are, uh, that you can see here. And, and I think this can be uh, linked quite well to iconography concerning um, deities or uh, mystical emperors. Let's take a look at this, for example. Here you have the first mythical Emperor Jimutenu, uh, or linking it uh, again. So these pictures from the Meiji period all use these rays of light, and, and Kano Jigoro here is put in the same position. So the light is coming from there, and they are just moving forwards to better the world. Or here, a picture of the sun goddess, Amaterasu. So A life lived, as I said before, has to remember it because of a reason. It has to be significant to a group, a, a community, a nation. And in that sense, biography is also an instrument, or better, an act of social self-description through which knowledge then is constructed. Biographies are, in other words, or can be seen as an act of social communication through which social groups, in this case, we are dealing with, with, the, group of, with the group of the judoka or Aikido uh, uh, people. So social groups reach an understanding about what they are, and not only about what they are, but also about what they want to be and how they want to be seen. So biographies are, in other words, not about true or false, asking a 
or ask the question when you approach biography, so it, did that really happen? For a while, for example, it bothered me really that the story on the boat with Carlo Giglio, because it, in all these texts, does it really, it did it really happen that way? Um, but actually, it doesn't matter at all. Um, we, we, we also, we, we don't know what was the motivation of the Russian officer. Would he have really been, in his position, be able to really fight? Uh, because Carlo Giglio was a guest, a paying guest. Would that have been possible? So all these elements, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it really happened. The question is, what is the Kodokan, what are biographers doing with that story? I think that's the, the um, important thing, because biographies ask us then to consider questions of knowledge, of ethics, and also, obviously, of power. And the, the, the institutions then, the biographers, make certain choices. They choose certain stories, place these stories within a certain context, um, and stress also certain teachings of Ueshiba or Kano. But actually, I think it's much more rewarding to look at what is not said in these biographies, what is left out. These gaps of what is not said are interesting as they lead us, I think, to cracks that might challenge an official narrative of an institution, uh, a, philosoph a philosophy, and so on. So actually, what do we not find in both manga? And um, obviously, both manga deal with a period in Japanese history that's quite controversial, at least. So, uh, and also in terms of world history, we have two world wars in that period. We have Japanese aggression, um, the atomic bomb. All these things are happening at, this, at that time. And now, I was expecting to find something of this also in the manga. And it is there to a certain degree. However, um, it is not a critical approach to history that we find. Uh, it is not questioning the school's involvement in that history. So um, there are no questions uh, in how far, for example, judo ideology as well as judo techniques also became an integral part of the mobilization of the Japanese people during the 20s and 30s. The, tra the same is actually true for the Ueshiba manga. There is no reflection whatsoever on nationalistic teachings or involvement with ultra-right-wing nationalists at that time. Ueshiba's involvement with the uh, syncretistic new religion, Omotokyo, um, and the raid against this uh, organization, that is mentioned. And also Ueshiba's journey to Manchukuo with the leader of that organization uh, is, is mentioned. However, this journey, for example, is motivated and justified as a journey to spiritually unite the Asian people. So it, it's, it's freeing the suppressed, therefore not only entirely excluding and ignoring any white wing connections of the organization itself, but also ignoring the political context of the Japanese annexation of Manchukuo, as well as the religious uh, nationalism or religious imperialism luring under the surface of this endeavor on the mainland. Actually, there's one interesting exception, and I would like to focus on that one in the Kano manga, where um, there is a really, like, a, where history becomes touchable in a way. And that is the story of uh, Hirose Takeo, who died in 1904 during the war against Russia. As, and, and he is a deified war hero in, in, in Japanese, that would be Gunjin, who died during uh, that uh, Russian-Japanese uh, war in the Battle of Port Arthur. So uh, Takeo Hirose here is first introduced as a very strong and devoted judo fighter. Uh, and the drawing style in that part, uh, which is um, before what I'm showing here, is usual shonen manga, sport manga style. So when he, um, Hirose Takeo is then sent to Russia, where he stayed as a, a military attaché, the manga suddenly adopts a different drawing style which very much resembles uh, a manga from the 70s, Rose of Versailles. 
which fits perfectly to the romantic involvement that he has with a young Russian lady. Um, obviously, you can already know that or the story he's dying in 1904, so it's not having a good end. It's very sad. But um, what we have here is a kind of um, um, a romantic setting with a scrim diffuser style drawing. And uh, then we see here his farewell due to an order to leave for the war. And then the next side actually is a very it's a, it's a, it's a su surprise to me because suddenly we see this. It's the uh, a, a stylistic break by the inclusion actually of contemporary war photography and indicating kind of zooming out of personal life and the explosion that we see here on the right side is on the textual level accompanied by a onomatopoetic sound, uh, so you can really hear it's the explosion on the boat, and which together with the photo kind of creates a strong empathic effect, uh, throwing the reader into the reality of war. Uh, and in the next slide then, we, we again see a change. On the right side again you see the, the reality of life and it, then suddenly the image changes and Hirose Takeo is coming back in manga style drawing, mingling, combining reality, historical reality with personal life in that case. So it's um, a sort of a photorealistic atmosphere in which the Hirose character is placed. And obviously, heroic stories of followers and subsequently erotication are crucial for underlining the uh, validi validity of a school's ideology, as well as body techniques and also increase visibility. But what is not done actually here is again giving uh, a broader context of um, the historical events. It's, it's, it's mainly focusing on personal stories. So, but, but these heroic stories are very important. I remember when um, the 9-11 um, attacks happened in, uh, in the States, and I was in Japan at that time, and I was talking to uh, Murata Naoki from the Kodokan. One of the main what, what he immediately told me was the fact that in one of the planes there was this judo fighter, uh, and he challenged the terrorists, and that was because of judo. So immediately, it was kind of occupied, and though there was a judo guy, and he tried to stop the terrorists. Uh, he didn't succeed, but still. And he was awarded also, I think, 10th Dan or so uh, posthumously um, after uh, the event. So this is kind of a part of that uh, uh, story. So when we now turn towards the Ueshiba manga, we will see a similar picture. Um, that historical background is not really problem, problematic, it's not really discussed. And in, uh, for example, World War II in the Ueshiba manga is only briefly introduced. It's mentioned in one panel here in the context of the bombing of Tokyo and then the capitulation, which shows Japanese, uh, as you can see here, uh, heads lowered, um, two crying women listening to the speech of the emperor announcing defeat. The quotes from the speech of the emperor, the imperial rescript on the termination of war, are not put actually into speech balloons, but placed as direct quotes above the head of the listeners. So these are quotes taken out of um, this uh, imperial rescript. Uh, so above the head of the shocked and listening, crying listeners. Uh, as an immediate contemporary account. And when we take a look at what has been taken out, I just take two quotes. The war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, while the general trends of the world have all turned against her interest. And the second, we have resolved to pave the way for grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. So these are the only parts taken out of the historical context. War is thus reduced to its impact on the Japanese people and the catastrophe 
lies in the bombardments, in surrender and hardship in Japan, but the political logic behind World War II, questions of war responsibility, for example, and aggression, are not asked. And Ueshiba, so that's what, he's, what the, the manga is all about himself, is not linked to war in, at, in any way, because at that time he already has been retreated to Iwama, to the countryside, where he's leading a life in solitude and in pursuit of peace and unity between him and the gods. So, uh, and that would be the next slide then. So, showing Ueshiba that he is not connected to all of that. Um, so, in that sense, the manga biographies are what Susan Stewart called miniatures, miniatures of history. And a miniature that creates coherence by not only excluding historical coincidence, so because we, we know that things just happen. It's a coincidence that things happen. It's not planned, but that's not happening in manga. It's, there's no coincidence, but it's all predetermination. And, but also, it's silencing, uh, marginalizing, uh, dissenting voices and threats to the general narrative of the uh, institution. So if you would further like to, to deepen our standing now uh, of the ways the Kodokan and also the Aikikai communicate um, an understanding about what they are and what they want to be, we should also now take a look actually at the situation in the 80s when the Kanu manga was published and also at the situation in, in around 2000 when the Aikido manga was published to see why was it published at that time, uh, what do they wanted to gain with that by publishing it, uh, at that time. I'm not doing that, uh, but it would be something that would also be interesting. But I would rather focus now on the genre of biographies and manga and, and take a look what kind of implications does that, does that have. So biographies are uh, a, a hybrid genre. They unfold their effect or their effects actually and their power in the space between fiction and non-fiction. They, they apply a story, or they, 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 more, no, they tell a life story by applying literary techniques, creating a narrative, pre-structuring, and retrospectively also giving meaning to life in and for a uh, pre-conceived context. Historians, accordingly, as well as sociologists, have questioned, obviously, the value of biographies for understanding the past. But by now we already know that also historians are pre-structuring, obviously, their texts and uh, creating a narrative. But they mainly criticize the genre for, as Bourdieu said it, Bourdieu said it, artificial creation of meaning and reducing the biographer to a literary writer or, as Ricoeur uh, put it, by narrating, and I quote, by narrating a life of which I am not the author as to existence, I make myself its co-author as to its meaning." Quote end. Now with, with, with biographies becoming very popular and a success actually in popular culture, like in films or manga, the genre of biography, uh, it seems it has absolutely been discredited in the eyes of, of many scholars. So, but that is also then, then when, but that seems also to be limited to, to, to or very limited view on the, on the topic because when we look at Japan, manga has an entirely different meaning within that cultural context that cannot be compared to the European context. Manga in Japan are actually used as educational tools. So here we have a manga on Japanese um, history. They are used by the government. For example, here the um, food education campaign from Aomori Prefecture. <laughs> That's because I'm just working on food education in, in Edo period, and it was funny to, to link it to, to, to contemporary Japan. But, and, or here, um, most recently, the, the government trying to advertise their attempts for revise for the revision of the constitution. So behind these uh, publications is the idea that actually manga can educate, that manga can be used to kind of transmit knowledge. 
And that's actually what also is the, the, the background of the Ueshiba manga and the Kano manga. So it is the idea that you really can transmit history also by that manga. And as you can see here on the wrapper, it says, because it's a manga, it's easy to understand, it's outstandingly and it's interesting. Seen from a, this specific cultural context in which manga are embedded, it thus comes actually to no surprise that the Kodokan as well as the Aikikai use the medium of manga to communicate the life of their founders and uh, also an understanding of their own being. Yet both manga are actually very different in their approach. Approach The manga, uh, the Kano manga, is hoping actually to widen the audience to also outside judo circles and address as well different age groups. This popularization is also expressed actually on the inside of the wrapper. So the, the green one here is the wrapper around the manga. And it, and it says, I quote, these authentic volumes have a high educational value and we hope that they will be widely read by primary school children as well as grown-ups, quote end. So it's really opening up the whole discourse. The intended readership as well as the purpose of the manga then also obviously have to translate in form. If I only want to write for children, I need a different form, form from uh, that when I also want to um, write for grown-ups. So the aesthetics of the drawings in general, as well as the techniques, follow those in popular uh, manga, the, the shonen manga, and especially that of sport manga. Now, also here is a sort of misconception often with manga, because manga are also very often not read by one age group, but although it might be written for 14 to 16 year old boys, Elderly, uh, or elderly or elder people are reading these manga as well, so it's not limited to um, this group. So a style that then could also read out, reach out to readership with no connections to the Kodokan at all. The manga also attaches furigana, so reading helps to every character. Even easy characters are provided with reading aids in the text. Um, Yet, by going beyond the conventions of the, the manga, by also including intertextual and actually intermedia references that we will take a look at later, uh, the manga will also be interesting to readers from other age groups and readers with prior knowledge. Because they suddenly see, oh, I have seen, seen this picture somewhere else before. It's from a history book. So uh, you can read actually the manga on a totally different level. Um, when we look at the Ueshiba manga, we did get a totally different picture. The uh, manga, in general, applies a more abstract drawing style that not only applies explanatory meta-texts, but also the sentence structure is much more complex and thus does not provide readings for even difficult kanji. So here you, you find some quite difficult readings and kanji, and this is not explained at all. Um, so if you don't know the terms, if you don't know the laws or the rate here, then you will not know what it is. So, Certainly, both manga use specialized language, so insider language, names of techniques, and so on. But where the Kano manga then gives the reading, and you can at least read it, uh, the Ueshiba manga will not do that. So you're just lost. Um, and the Kano manga is just, is just educating also the reader. And in the Ueshiba manga, if you are not initiated into the art, you will not be able, able to read these words. In that sense, actually, we can also argue that using popular media is not necessarily an opening, but, as in the case of the Ueshiba manga here, it's a closure. And as a discourse of community um, which is based on knowledge. And the community that is created here, or no, the community that we have here actually creates, reconfirms, and also keeps knowledge within. It's not opening uh, towards the outside uh, world. So, uh, choosing manga or a graphic novel as medium for representation of a historical personality offers opportunities that actually go beyond traditional means of historiography, as well as literary narration, as narration in manga uh, also happens on the level of images, obviously. That's, that's one of the big advantages. And according to Susan Sontag, uh, these have, I quote, extraordinary powers 
to determine demands on reality, quote end. So whatever, however, to be accepted as historiography, the manga also has to identify itself as such. So you have to include markers that this is actually historical writing. You have markers of authenticity, historicity, uh, on, on different levels, text and pictures. Uh, I think Roland Barthes called it the uh, effects of reality that you have to include here. So what are then precisely these strategies that are um, applied here? The first way to strengthen the impression that the text is indeed a scholarly book is by following accepted modes of scholarly research. So you include quotes, you have a table of content, um, a short text that introduces each chapter, um, you work with footnotes, you give additional information in footnotes on historical figures that appear, techniques or events that are appearing in the stories. Both manga actually are doing it. Uh, although with not having prior knowledge, you will not be able to read it actually in the Ueshiba manga. Um, so this is all part, and then you have what um, is called a peritext. So that's not the text itself, but it's surrounding um, uh, the text. And here also we find that the readers promised to read a true story, an authentic story. Um, of a real historical uh, figure. And uh, if you look at another point, that is the editor-in-chief, for example, Ueshiba Morihe, the, the grandson of the founder of Aikido, uh, explains in his introduction to the biography, he actually explains what kind of sources he is using, he's explaining what kind of approach, and even the production process is explained uh, by him, it, thus kind of creating a job, uh, an objective scholarly field. And he then also lists 12 books as source for his uh, work. Um, another aspect of authenticity is then by referring to real stories, jitsuwa, uh, as it is in Japanese, which are oral transmissions from, in this case, his grandfather, his father. You used up the extra time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, until half, right? Oh, yeah. Well, we want to ask some questions. And just oh, OK, OK. So um, and then I would continue with the pictorial elements, uh, like including historical pictures, like here, the Kodokan. Um, here we have three boys visiting uh, the Kodokan library, and they are handed three books, um, which are also then identified. We could discuss in how far these are actually historical. Oh, written by historians, because they all, all the writers, Kato, Oimatsu, they all have links to the Kodokan uh, or to Kano Jigoro. Um, we can read, we look over the shoulders of the uh, boys looking into the history of the founder. Um, texts that are written by Kano are mentioned, and, and here at the copy, we have a letter that is copied into the manga. We have Po uh, pictures posted into the manga. So here you have Kano Jigoro and Yamashita uh, doing a demonstration, and this take actually taken from a book. Um, we have shown this picture before of the raid of the Omotokyo, and this is also taken from uh, a picture. And if you have read the biography of Ueshiba Kishomari, the son, then you will find that picture as well. So increasing this kind of historical authenticity idea in the manga, or here, which seems a fair enough drawing, but if you look at the history of the Kodokan and read the books, you will find it's actually taken from a drawing, uh, a painting uh, that uh, relates to the 8086-8089 period of judo. And then uh, the same will happen with, with uh, a kind of zooming in on the history we have here uh, an explanation where Kano, uh, where Kano was born, and you could follow it as a trip. You could go on a trip and follow that by following that card. Um, here we have a picture of Kano uh, when he's younger. It's actually taken out of a picture, of a photo, that you can see here, but his brother is taken out. He was out of the picture. He was larger anyway, so it might not be good to have him included in the picture because Kano has to be the biggest one. And here you can see the stops. You can actually go there today following that uh, line. Ueshiba Manga is applying the same uh, technique here. With, and this is a picture for, taken from the manga. If you read again 
the biography, then you will find it, it comes from that source. Again, increasing a sense of authenticity. And then I stop here. <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah, of, of, of course. Yes, uh, I don't. Um, I expect the um, circulation for the Ueshiba manga uh, much lower mm -hmm. because it's a very small publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's very much in the hands of the Aikikai itself. So they are controlling actually the process of writing, publishing, and also drawing because um, the uh, manga artist drawing the Ueshiba manga she was um, actually in constant contact with Moriteru at that time. So they were discussing actually how to, to draw historical persons, so uh, real persons that might even be living at that time. So um, there was always this contact between, uh, during the process between Aikikai, Moriteru, at that time he was not yet actually the, uh, the head of Aikikai, um, but he was to become the head of the Aikikai, I think, in 2000 or 2001. That's very interesting also in terms of the process of creating the manga because um, it's already showing a, a turn. These, so the, the, the publisher here, it's a very small publisher, so the, the numbers will not be high. And, um, it's not easy to purchase, so I guess that it's... Um, but if you are at the Aikikai Hombu Dojo, you will be able to buy it. But if you go to a shop in Japan, you will not be able to see it. You have to order it by Amazon. With the um, Kano Jiguro manga, uh, I assume that the uh, publication numbers were higher, because it was also intended to go outside of the, um, of the um, Kodokan world, and uh, as it is intended also to a broader readership, and obviously also the, the number of people practicing judo in Japan is higher than that of, of Aikido, so that would also have an increased readership. As far as the uh, production process then um, concerned of the uh, Kodokan, um, the, the manga or the, 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 the drawer of the manga is actually a mangaka, so he's professional manga. Uh, who also drew other manga, uh, mainly uh, sports manga, which is different from the manga uh, in the Ueshiba. So this uh, woman was not related to uh, any um, manga, uh, to any um, sports manga before. Um, two things. The first, I thought it was really interesting. Um, but when you're talking about going to uh, Manchuria, uh, and you said it written in such a way as to ignore the political context. Yes. Um, and actually, I think what's happening is um, the way you described it, it sounds like it's not ignoring the political context, but reproducing the rhetoric to justify Japanese imperial expansion and colonial uh, incursion in the first place. I mean, it's, we will, um, you know, join hands mm -hmm. with our Asian brethren and um, relieve ourselves of the burden of European colonialism. And so it's really a reproduction rhetoric, it seemed to me. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting, and I'm wondering if you thought about it, is the images of enlightenment that you showed with the sun, and tracing that back, you know, to uh, Ahmad Hassan in some cases. Oh, yeah, uh, to me, uh, immediately I thought of these uh, but kind it's of... it's also the flag. Of, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, the Japanese wartime flag that is very much marked with the sun in the middle and the rays spreading out. And I'm wondering if you thought about the confluence or overlap between the images of the flag and the images of enlightenment that are supposedly apolitical. Uh, first of all, I think that the, um, um, when you mentioned the reproduction of, of the rhetoric, uh, that actually it describes it much better, I would say. So that's a very uh, a good hint to, to, to that. So, and then um, for as far as the, the flag is concerned, yes, obviously, 
uh, there is, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, a, a link, uh, especially also not only in terms of enlightenment, but also in terms of, of, uh, of aggression, of, of, of maybe if you, if you put it in other words, of, of forwardness, of, of expanding, that that's certainly in there. And it's, it's, uh, it's also in all these pictures of Amaterasu or Jimutenu, if you look at it, it's, it's always at least in the Jimutenno pictures, and these are all from, from Meiji period, um, it's enemies, because it's, it's, it's there. Um, and it, it's also in, in a term, well, it, it's, it's, it's a question of how to interpret it, because it's, it's directed to the outward world, and you also, as in Jimutenno, you have a cause a just cause why you are doing something right. and that, that's, in, that's here as well but interesting is if we look at uh, um, the, there are pictures of the flag here uh, also on one of the manga I think the picture I had was also with, with a later one I, um, but then it's not the war flag actually it's the Hinomaru because um, it would much more fit within the general narrative of the Kodokan. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about, because you talked about reading the absences, and, and the, the greatest absence in this case is that of the relationship to nationalism and yes. its rhetoric. Yes, and because it does not fit into the, national, uh, into the narrative of the Kodokan. But if you look at, uh, for example, one of the elements uh, that the Kodokan is, is promoting, obviously, is peace, uh, depicting Kano Jigoro as a pacifist. But if you look at the historical context, actually we cannot say, or depending on what definition you have of a pacifist, you cannot say that actually, because he was never against Japan having a strong army. He was for having a very strong army uh, in Japan as means to protect the Japanese nation against aggression from the outside world. So in that sense, he was certainly not a pacifist. Um, then when we look at, for example, his um, development of um, gymnastics in the uh, late 20s, 30s, where he developed gymnastics that were called um, kobush, Kobushiki Taiso. So it, it's kind of um, um, gymnastics to defend the nation, which were supposed to, 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 to strengthen the Japanese youth. So these things are obviously not mentioned from that perspective, but they are reinterpreted in a way of uh, not linking it to any um, wartime problematic propaganda. Uh, I, I think that that was great. And I think that the, the talk was, was more educational about, about education culturally and, uh, and, um, than it was really about martial arts because I think that it, it's interesting we see biography is a, such a discredited genre by academics but actually you could say the same about documentary I mean mm. you know so, uh, someone like Ray Chow and actually f film studies you know the way that people do film studies is by what Jameson called you know everything becomes a national allegory like like uh, Mike wants to make this national allegory, and you don't want it to be. You want your thing. There's something else going on as well. So, um, in a way, this kind of, like showing this the complexity of this as a as an educational genre and device and style in Japan, um, either deliberately or just just because people like reading about this stuff, it kind of does more to challenge the kind of academic categories that we, we prefer, we like to use, like we like to, we would, you know, historians like to think that they can be history and mm. be free from structure or free from narrative. That's what, that's what I found most suggestive, about the, way, the, the way in which something like this can take on and be a, a and, and circle around academic categories and provide and reintroduce them and play with them and have all these different sorts of effects. Yeah, I mean, that, that's also why these, these manga are also so so effective and so successful, I think, because um, history writing, in my opinion, also is about, or writing biographies, is about giving a, a, a vivid picture, a vivid idea of a historical context. I want to understand a period. I want, 
actually to have a feeling also of that period. Obviously, it cannot be, you do, do, do not know uh, how to be a bad or how a bad feels. That's, that's impossible, obviously. But, but still, uh, we, you want to transmit that idea of a period. And that is actually what is achieved here um, on, on one level. So you get a vivid picture of that person. And that is then sold, or maybe it is historical. Uh, what? Okay. Well, we should, we shouldn't take another question. We should try and stay on time. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.